really sweet to be here. Um, I should start by just giving a little bit of background. Uh, I'm, I'm trained as an urban planner and an artist. Um, I went to school in the Midwest at Iowa State, and um, uh, urban planning got boring, and so I went to the basement where the ceramics department was and took a couple classes and thought that I would uh, uh, end up either being a bureaucrat for city government, which I did for a little while, or um, working for black religious institutions, um, kind of helping them reimagine poor black places. That it seemed black churches was the, was the institution locally that could allow me to move um, planning things forward. Um, neither worked. And I found myself uh, kind of being a rogue you know, this kind of Ronin artist uh, on a mission. And so I'm going to show you some of my exploits. This works. Um, so I thought I should just start by uh, just, just saying that I'm an artist. Like, I make art objects that they, they fit in museums. Um, we sell them for a lot of money. Uh, and part of the way that I'll talk about uh, what moved me from disempowerment to empowerment was this moment where um, art objects had this imaginary value, and then that value was then used um, to make things happen in my neighborhood. Um, uh, from early on in my planning practice, I realized that I wanted um, to have this uh, experiment with myself. That if the conversation about uh, segregation and desegregation, about urban redevelopment and renewal, had everything to do with black people moving away from black neighborhoods as soon as they could be better, or people moving up, ascending into a better housing stock, or a better this, or better schools, or safer places, that there is something about um, people's desire to move away from poverty, move away from a problem. What would happen if I just stayed where I was, got the promotion at the University of Chicago, and I stayed, sold the artwork, and stayed? And then that, how could uh, that, that position of uh, staying uh, kind of be, be impacted? Um, these objects um, come out of uh, some of the abandoned buildings that I'll talk about in a second. So uh, this idea of the redeemed. Um, four years ago, uh, Wrigley's Chewing Gum, which had been abandoned for about 20 years in my neighborhood, uh, uh, were having a big sale of all of the things that had been left there. And some scavengers had been allowed to come and take all of the things. One of the things that they had were these uh, 10,000 uh, wear boards, these uh, conveyor pallets that would move chewing gum from one part of the space to another. Uh, someone asked me if I wanted to uh, uh, buy the wear boards at 10 cents a board. So I said, yeah, I'll take, I'll take a thousand of them. So I took a thousand and I uh, built a small temple. This was four years ago. No one knew my work. I was just a, a lonely artist. I had to buy a space so that I could show my own work. And, uh, and, uh, and so I kind of took advantage of this abandoned commercial space. Number one, the use of abandoned space. Kind of created my own temporary organization that would make people more hungry to come to the space. And then I um, had this exhibition um, called Temple Exercise One. After I built the space, I wanted to um, um, activate the space. That, that there was a way that the, the small temple made me think, wow, well, something should happen here. And I ended up creating a group called the Black Monks of Mississippi, which has become like the musical complement to some of the visual work. Um, because I had made a transition from clay to wood, that was enough to enter me into the world of the contemporary. So the Museum of Contemporary <laughs> Art decided, wow, oh, well, he's not a potter anymore. He's a contemporary conceptualist. Um, <laughs> and uh, I found myself with an exhibition at the Museum of Contemporary Art. Uh, again, the boards from the west side of Chicago um, to this uh, abandoned building, this commercial space, to the Museum of Contemporary Art. The, the Black Monks were now eight months old. We had a repertoire. We had a following of 400 people. We rocked the Museum of Contemporary Art um, <laughs> out there. Um, that this gave me an opportunity to not only think about um, uh, how contemporary art is made, but also like kind of um, uh, an opportunity to redeem parts of my history with the black church. <clears throat> Think about musicians in the jazz scene and the soul scene. I wanted to figure out a space where we could all come together, do our thing, and in this moment where I had access to the biggest 
kind of cultural institution in the city. How could I leverage the cultural institution to do things that were a little bit different? Um, you know, how could I advance the idea of a contemporary practice by adding a cultural moment that was maybe lacking, missing from the contemporary art scene? That went really well. Um, uh, curators are funny. They, uh, uh, if, if you do well and you're nice, they tell other curators. They go to curated conferences. They say, what's hot? Yeah, it's just hot. Use them. Uh, so uh, this brother, Francesco Bonami, who was the uh, uh, curator for the Whitney Biennial in 2010, gave me a call and said, uh, do, do you have more of those wear boards? You know, could your monks come to New York and perform? And I think that um, what started to happen was there was this way in which uh, the boards represented kind of like uh, this migration of black bodies, you know, this, like this labored work, excuse me, that, that moved from the west side of Chicago filled with powdered sugar and shit. You know, the, the rats had created condominiums in between these little stacks. And they, they required some redeeming. They required uh, some care. And so it was, it was awesome that these boards ended up being um, in the 2010 biennial. And I, um, along at the same time, uh, projects were, were happening where uh, museums were asking me to like respond to Gordon Matta Clark. So the Pulitzer is saying, can you think about art um, at the Pulitzer? And then 10 blocks away, you have not only a severe abandonment, but like um, brick years. <laughs> brothers who would um, burn out a building, kick down the parapet, bricks would fall, they'd clean them up. Um, those bricks would be sold to New Orleans or China or, right? Um, if you ask a cop, a cop would say, you know, these damn black people always tearing down buildings. No sense for their believing in their own environments. It's, a, it's, a, it's horrific. You should, they should be ashamed of themselves. When in fact, these brothers were working for a colonial brick manufacturer, a, you know, a large white conglomerate. That's, so how do you start to think about these like, more complex issues of how cities work? Um, how informal and for formal labor works, right? When you see a brother getting arrested because he's uh, uh, um, tearing down a building and he's trying to survive, how do you put that in relationship to the owner of Colonial Brick Manufacturing Company? I wanted to like have a, a kind of contemporary practice that would be discursive with the kind of complex activity of the city. I wanted to, um, instead of tearing down a building and moving it like Gordon Matta Clark into the space, I wanted to ask the Pulitzer, Andy, how can I use your money to restore some of these buildings? And so that's when I felt like um, uh, the leveraging went from just moving artists of color into museums and allowing for a bigger museum experience to saying, museums, what's possible for us uh, if we were to think about uh, North St. Louis, North Omaha, North Minneapolis, South Chicago? Uh, so I thought what I'd try to do quickly is just talk about the ecology of one project. Um, in 2008, I bought a building that was next to me. Um, the building had been um, blighted because all of the Section 8 dwellers that lived in my neighborhood, their vouchers moved them to another part of the uh, periphery of the city. In the summer, they were all gone. Everybody that was renting was all gone. And then all of the folk who were like slumlords um, had this property on their hands that had these inflated mortgages because um, they had been able to borrow against the money that these brothers, and, you know, these folk were getting from Section 8. So what was left were like uh, a neighborhood full of uh, owners who had been there 20 or 30, y'all know the story, um, and then a bunch of abandoned it. Um, for the last 10 years, I had been like, what was me? I can't get a house. Won't nobody get me a loan. You know, <laughs> you know was, that's how it works. You know, like, anyway, I, th this building went from a value of $240,000 to $16,000 in three years. Um, that Chicago, 10 blocks away from the University of Chicago, uh, had a uh, um, space that, um, the rest of the city regarded as having no value. And there was no value because that's where black people lived. There were no amenities there. They called it a food the desert. And they assumed that nothing, nothing happened there. Just not true. Um, so I, I would, um, I acquired this building. I started to take um, some of the materials 
from those buildings and convert those materials into like the contemporary, a way of kind of um, talking about the racialized, geographized city, but in the context of a contemporary art form. Um, at the same time, my art, my art practice was growing, my urban planning practice was growing, and just thought, how can I uh, let people know the challenges that I'm thinking about through this form and then allow them to also leverage those moments and allow them to be kind of stewards with me in this one neighborhood that I'm not moving from. Um, those things would circulate through an art gallery, through a museum, they get paid, and then this building that had been an abandoned two-story building next to me became um, a, a, a repository for Prairie Avenue Bookstore, uh, uh, a big art and architect architecture bookstore in the Midwest in Chicago that had gone out of business, and they were trying to figure out what to do with their books um, for the price of his last month's rent, $4,000. Bill Hasbrook said, if you commit to the library being accessible to the people in your neighborhood, you could just, you could have it. And so um, then the house wasn't just a kind of abandoned house without purpose or the, the, the commentary that I've been saying that there were no libraries. It gave me a chance to at least ask the question to the city, what in the hell do you mean you can't afford to build a library in this neighborhood? All it takes is an abandoned building at $4,000 worth of books. Right? So it was, it was still, it felt like an art gestural moment that I was attempting to kind of make fun of my alderman. I was trying to like spoof all of the black middle class. I was mad at the Jews that I left there, like we're trying to figure out how can I help, but like really not having an inroad. I wanted to like make the cultural elite of the city feel stupid that they haven't done something in my neighborhood. So I built it. And I, I built it as a kind of poetic, a polemic. Um, after that building was uh, done, it housed a, a glass lantern slide archive, it housed um, Prairie Avenue Bookstore, and then Dr. Wax, a really important black uh, music record store, went out of business. And for you know, 15 cents an album, I bought 14,000 albums. It was this moment where I felt like my art practice was a practice of kind of uh, uh, archiving, right? That it was uh, attempting to, to be a repository for knowledge, but then I was thinking, how could I leverage all of these bodies of knowledge in my neighborhood to have other people then engaged with me um, in, in acts of restoration, in acts of redevelopment. Um, and so that, that space, this space here, has become now um, a, a public gathering space. There are now five buildings. Um, as the buildings have grown, um, we've been able to um, enter a conversation with the Chicago Housing Authority they found out about the work. Um, these buildings were going to be demolished. Um, I asked them, could this be an intentional artist community? It's a block and a half away from um, the sites that I had been working on. Um, I found the master developer of, um, I can't tell if that's my bell or if that's some ringing. Um, but I found the master developer of the housing authority who <laughs> agreed to work with me. Uh, and now these 36 units will become 15 units for um, uh, low-income families with interest in arts, in the arts, and then 15 units for uh, artists who are in need of affordable housing. Six units will become this kind of shared workspace where artists from either side could kind of <coughs> do some skill sharing. It's a 4.5 million dollar project um, that is fully funded by the Chicago Housing Authority and the TIF, TIF in my neighborhood. And so I think the point that I'm trying to make to you guys is just that um, what worked really well was the fact that I was um, um, engaged with my neighbors on my block, um, and they were, they understood that when there was nothing else going on, that there was this position that like, oh, Mr. Piazza got a good job at the university, and he's staying. When he fixes his fence, he gonna ask me if I want my fence fixed, and we good. But it, but that that three years of laboring with that small project helped make legible this $4.5 million project. And that, that it really required um, intimate relationship with my neighbors, intimate relationship with like these alternative cultural communities. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 